An electric motor is a device that converts electrical energy into electromagnetic energy and then into mechanical energy, such as rotation, which can be used to rotate the wheels of a vehicle. Although there are several different types of motors which have different designs, they all use the same fundamental principles of electromagnetism. And they all have two key components. Number one, magnets or electromagnets which are stationary, which we call the stator, and number two, magnets or electromagnets which rotate, which we call the rotor. This type of motor is called a permanent magnet motor. The stator is made up of electromagnets, which are copper wires wound into coils or windings, while the rotor is made up of permanent magnets, after which the motor is named. When electric current flows through the copper windings of the stator, each winding becomes an electromagnet, producing an electromagnetic field. Since this is an alternating current, with the direction of current alternating backwards and forwards, the polarity of the electromagnetic fields also alternates. The alternating electromagnetic fields from each winding combine to give a rotating electromagnetic field, or RMF, which rotates around the stator. We call this the stator field. Meanwhile, each permanent magnet of the rotor produces a permanent magnetic field, which we call the rotor field. The attractive and repulsive magnetic forces between the stator field, shown here in orange, and the rotor field, shown here in white, cause the rotor to physically rotate as the rotor field wants to maintain alignment with the stator field. If you want to learn more about how these electromagnetic fields are generated and how they interact to produce rotation of the rotor, check out our video on electric motors. Link in the description below. The main body or core of both the rotor and the stator is made of a special type of steel called electrical steel, also known as silicon steel. Rather than being made of solid monolithic blocks, the electrical steel rotor core and stator core are made up of thin disks called laminations, usually between just 0.1 and 0.4 millimeters in thickness, which are coated with an electrically insulating coating of either a ceramic or an epoxy resin, and then bonded together. So what is electrical steel? What is its purpose? Why is it used in the form of thin laminations like this? And why are the laminations coated with an electrically insulating coating? Electrical steel is an ultra-low carbon steel, typically with less than 0.005% carbon, and alloyed primarily with silicon at 3-4%, hence why it's sometimes called silicon steel. Additional alloy elements are seldom, typically with a maximum of just 0.5% manganese. The main design philosophy behind electrical steel is to provide a combination of high magnetic permeability and high electrical resistivity. Magnetic permeability is the ability with which a material can carry a magnetic field, while electrical resistivity is the ability with which a material can oppose an electric current. The combination of high magnetic permeability and high electrical resistivity is tricky to achieve since magnetism and electricity go hand in hand, both relying on the movement of electrons. However, in electrical steel, iron provides high magnetic permeability as one of the few permanent magnetic materials but unlike other permanent magnetic materials, such as cobalt, iron is also highly abundant and relatively cheap. Silicon is then added to the iron, since silicon increases the electrical resistivity while having minimal effect on iron's magnetic permeability. As is the case for almost all types of steel, carbon is present for interstitial solid solution strengthening, while manganese is present for substitutional solid solution strengthening. So why is it necessary to have this combination of high magnetic permeability and high electrical resistivity. Let's return to the stator core. The stator core has a number of teeth around which a copper wire is wound. To make things easier to visualize, let's focus in on just one tooth of the stator core. The copper wire, or winding, carries electric current to become an electromagnet. Notice as the current alternates backwards and forwards, the polarity of the electromagnetic field also alternates. The first purpose of the stator core is to provide a structure on which the copper windings can be housed. The stator core therefore needs some degree of strength and stiffness to carry the load of the copper windings. The small carbon and manganese additions provide the strength to help with this, as does the sizeable silicon addition which contributes to substitutional solid solution strengthening. The second purpose of the stator core is to reinforce the electromagnetic fields from the copper windings. Iron, which is the main element, accounting for around 95% of the electrical steel composition, 
can reinforce the electromagnetic fields from the copper windings since it is a permanent magnetic material. This means free electrons of the iron atoms, floating around in the sea of free electrons, naturally align in preferred orientations with all of the free electrons spinning on their own axis in the same direction. In this case, notice how all of the free electrons are spinning on their own axis counterclockwise. This alignment of free electron spin produces what are called magnetic domains. Collectively, the magnetic domains produce a permanent magnetic field, with a south pole and a north pole. Notice how the field lines, which point in the same direction as the united electron spin, run from the north pole to the south pole. When iron is placed in an external magnetic field, such as the electromagnetic field of the copper winding, which remember wraps around the iron core, the free electrons, the magnetic domains and thus the permanent magnetic field of the iron core aligns itself with the electromagnetic field of the copper winding. Here we will space out the copper winding from the iron core so we can see the two magnetic fields more clearly. If we bring the copper winding back into place, wrapping around the iron core, we can see the electromagnetic field of the copper winding is reinforced by the permanent magnetic field of the iron core. We can visualise this as an increase to the number of field lines. The outcome is higher magnetic force from the stator field, and so the rotor physically rotates with more torque and more power. Remember, the current in the copper winding is an alternating current. Each time the current alternates its direction, the polarity of the electromagnetic field of the copper winding also alternates. Each time the electromagnetic field of the copper winding alternates its polarity, the permanent magnetic field of the iron core also alternates its polarity to maintain alignment and reinforcement. However, this does not happen instantaneously, in perfect synchronization as shown here. In reality, there is a delay between the electromagnetic field of the copper winding alternating its polarity and the permanent magnetic field of the iron core alternating its polarity. This delay experienced by the permanent magnetic field of the iron core is characterized by something called the hysteresis loop. The hysteresis loop describes the ability of a material to retain a permanent magnetic field as a function of applied magnetizing force. We can illustrate the hysteresis loop with the following graph. The horizontal axis is labelled H, which represents the applied magnetizing force, which in our case is the magnetizing force coming from the electromagnetic field of the copper winding. The vertical axis is labelled B, which represents the magnetic field density, which in our case is the number of field lines generated by the iron core. Notice we have positive and negative sides to each axis. Let's bring our copper winding and iron core back in. Let's colour the electromagnetic field lines of the copper winding orange and the permanent magnetic field lines of the iron core blue. As current flows through the copper winding in one direction, in this case from left to right, the magnitude of current increases to a peak value and in turn, the magnetising force from the copper winding also increases to a peak value. The magnetising force can be shown by the size of the orange field. As the magnetising force from the copper winding increases, the iron core becomes magnetised with an increase to its magnetic field density, as shown by the number of blue field lines. If we plot the magnetic field density of the iron core as a function of the applied magnetising force from the copper winding, we get what is called the magnetisation curve. Eventually, the magnetisation curve levels out at the saturation point, where magnetic field density of the iron core cannot be increased any further despite possible further increase to the applied magnetic force from the copper winding. This is since the magnetic field density has reached saturation, where no more field lines can be crammed in. With an alternating current, once the magnitude of current has reached its peak value, it decreases back to zero. In turn, the magnetizing force from the copper winding also decreases back to zero. However, as the magnetizing force from the copper winding decreases back to zero, the magnetic field density of the iron core does not decrease back to zero. Instead, some field lines of the iron core remain. This is called the retentivity point. For an electromagnet with a direct current DC supply, which maintains magnetism with constant polarity, such as an electromagnet in a scrapyard used for picking up and moving around scrap, a high retentivity point may be considered a good thing, since each time the electromagnet is switched on, fewer fresh field lines need to be added to reach maximum magnetization, that is, the saturation point. However, for an electromagnet in an AC motor, which is what we have here, 
a high retentivity point is not a good thing. That's because, as we have already seen, as the alternating current in the copper winding alternates its direction, the electromagnetic field of the copper winding also alternates its polarity. In order for the permanent magnetic field of the iron core to maintain reinforcement of the electromagnetic field of the copper winding, the permanent magnetic field of the iron core also needs to alternate its polarity. However, before it can do that, its previous magnetic field of positive polarity as we see it on the graph here, which is still hanging around as per the retentivity point, needs to be removed. Notice how at this stage the magnetic fields of the copper winding and of the iron core are of opposite polarity. This isn't very helpful. As the magnetizing force from the copper winding increases, which is now of negative polarity, the magnetic field density of the iron core, which is of positive polarity, is brought back down to zero. We call this the coercivity point, which represents the magnetizing force required to eliminate the previous field lengths. As the magnetizing force from the copper winding increases beyond the coercivity point, the iron core becomes magnetized again with an increase to its magnetic field density, but this time of negative polarity and therefore in alignment with and reinforcement of the electromagnetic field of the copper winding. Thus, we have another magnetization curve, but this time of negative polarity. Again, eventually the magnetization curve levels out at the saturation point, where magnetic field density of the iron core cannot be increased any further. Again, once the magnitude of current has reached its peak value, it decreases back to zero. In turn, the magnetizing force from the copper winding also decreases back to zero. However, as the magnetizing force from the copper winding decreases back to zero, the magnetic field density of the iron core does not decrease back to zero. Instead, some field lines of the iron core remain at the retentivity point. As the alternating current in the copper winding alternates its direction once again, the electromagnetic field of the copper winding also alternates its polarity and the permanent magnetic field of the iron core also needs to alternate its polarity. But before it can do that, its previous magnetic field, now of negative polarity as per the retentivity point, needs to be removed. As the magnetizing force from the copper winding increases, which is now of positive polarity, the magnetic field density of the iron core, which is of negative polarity, is brought back down to zero at the coercivity point. Remember, the coercivity point represents the magnetizing force required to eliminate the previous field lines. As the magnetizing force from the copper winding increases beyond the coercivity point, the iron core becomes magnetized again with an increase to its magnetic field density, but this time of positive polarity. Thus, we have another magnetization curve and again, eventually the magnetization curve levels out at the saturation point. This gives us the complete hysteresis loop of the iron core. Over repeated alternating current cycles, with the current inside the copper winding repeatedly alternating backwards and forwards, the hysteresis loop of the iron core continues to loop. A broad hysteresis loop with far spaced coercivity points indicates the core material can retain a magnetic field very easily requiring a lot of magnetizing force and thus input electrical energy to the copper windings to eliminate the core's magnetic field. In contrast, a slender hysteresis loop with narrowly spaced coercivity points indicates the core material can eliminate one magnetic field and then rebuild a new magnetic field of opposite polarity very easily and does not require a lot of magnetizing force and thus input electrical energy to the copper winding to do so. In the stator core and the rotor core of an electric motor, a slender hysteresis loop is what we want, since spending electrical energy on eliminating one magnetic field and then rebuilding a new magnetic field is wasteful and inefficient, taking electrical energy away from what could otherwise be transferred into mechanical energy to rotate the rotor. We call this wasted energy the hysteresis loss. The magnitude of hysteresis loss is given by the area of the hysteresis loop and can be calculated with the following equation. Pure iron has a relatively slender hysteresis loop, similar to that shown on the right. Adding alloying elements to the iron so to create electrical steel actually broadens the hysteresis loop, similar to that shown on the left, and thereby increases hysteresis loss, which is clearly a bad thing. So why do we use electrical steel at the stator core and rotor core of electric motors? Why not use pure iron with its smaller hysteresis loss? In addition to hysteresis loss, we have another type of loss to think about, 
When a conductor, such as iron, is placed in a magnetic field, in this case the electromagnetic field of the copper winding, electric current, also known as eddy current, is induced in the conductor. This also lowers efficiency of the motor, since energy is now wasted as electrical energy trapped in the core material, taking that energy away from what could otherwise be transferred into mechanical energy to rotate the rotor. We call this wasted energy the eddy current loss. Further, a lot of that wasted electrical energy from the eddy current loss ends up as thermal energy, or heat, which can then damage the motor and cause it to fail. This is why we want the stator core to have high magnetic permeability and high electrical resistivity. We want the stator core to be permeated by the electromagnetic fields from the copper windings and thereby strengthen those electromagnetic fields. But we don't want the stator core to experience induced currents. The silicon addition to the iron increases electrical resistivity or decreases electrical conductivity while having minimal effect on magnetic permeability. Segmenting the stator core into thin disks or laminations which are electrically isolated from each other by the electrically insulating coating reduces eddy current losses further. Current is still induced in each lamination but these are small currents whereas in a single monolithic block currents are free to generate over a much larger area and so are much larger. As shown by the equation, eddy current losses can be minimized by reducing the magnetic flux density, which is the density of field lines. Reducing the frequency of magnetic reversals per second, which is equal to the input AC frequency. Reducing the lamination thickness, or by reducing the overall volume of material. With the exception of laminate thickness, all of these factors also reduce the torque and power output from the motor. Thus, reducing laminate thickness is a clever way of reducing eddy current losses and maximizing efficiency of the motor while still achieving big torque and big power. At the rotor core, it's exactly the same principle as at the stator core. The purpose of the rotor core is to densify and strengthen the magnetic fields of the permanent magnets, or in the case of an induction motor, as we have here, the electromagnetic fields from the rotor bars, but with minimal eddy currents being induced in the rotor core itself. However, with the rotor core, things get a little more complicated. While making the laminations thinner reduces eddy current losses and thereby increases efficiency of the motor, thinner laminations are mechanically weaker and less stiff, and so produce a weaker overall rotor core which is less tolerant of radial forces during rotation. This is important for the rotor core since it can rotate at more than 10,000 RPM and generate more than 250 Newton meters of torque. This then creates a demand for a rotor core material which has the combination of high magnetic permeability, high electrical resistivity and high strength. Strength of steel can be increased by a number of mechanisms, including interstitial solid solution strengthening, substitutional solid solution strengthening, grain boundary strengthening, dislocation strengthening, precipitation strengthening and second phase strengthening. All of these strengthening mechanisms work by inhibiting the migration of dislocations through the material. However, all of these strengthening mechanisms also inhibit the generation and migration of magnetic fields through the material and thereby increase hysteresis losses and decrease magnetic permeability. This is why, with the exception of large silicon additions for electrical resistivity, electrical steels have very lean chemical compositions with minimal solid solution strengthening. This is also why electrical steels have very large grain sizes of typically more than 100 microns and why they have single phase ferritic microstructures without any secondary phases or intentional dislocations and with very carefully controlled precipitates, if any at all. The challenge with electrical steels, especially for rotor core applications, is to increase the strength of the material and thereby permit thinner laminations which minimize eddy current losses but without degrading magnetic permeability and without increasing hysteresis losses.